But the one point she made there was like really making sure you're arching your upper back and like bending your neck forward as well. That's not really necessary. If you look about what you're trying to work, which is essentially the glutes here, arching your upper back is not going to change how those glutes are working. We are back once again with the Renegade Master and we're talking about five unforgiving mistakes that have proven to kill your glute gains, which I'm hoping will give me the secrets and the tips that have been preventing me from building a bootalicious bottom because clearly something's not working. And by something not working, I mean it's probably because I don't train it directly and I neglect training my glutes because do as I say, not as I do. And we're looking at Kiara. I think it's Kiara. I've probably butchered that, but we're going to go with it anyway. And we're going to talk about some of the things that are apparently preventing the gain. But before we do so, I must quickly say, if at any point throughout this entire video you decide you actually like the video, then please let me know you like the video, and maybe even consider clicking the button that could be white, could be red, down below to subscribe to the channel, and maybe even tickle the bell next to it so you get notified when I upload every week, twice a week. But if you don't want to do that, then just dislike the video and leave a nasty comment. Doing too much cardio, either on the bike, on the treadmill, or on the stairmaster, can actually affect your performance when you're actually weightlifting. Actually very valid, a very good tip and trick there. Essentially, doing too much before a workout, depending on what your goals are, obviously, can negatively impact your performance, as she did state. Obviously, when you are exerting yourself a lot through the means of cardiovascular activity, so low intensity steady state, perhaps, or high intensity interval training, something like that, you are then essentially depleting yourself before the resistance session afterwards. If you're doing cardio and weight training, depending on your goals, obviously, I would usually, especially if your goals are kind of like strength and hypertrophy or resistance focus heavy, we should say, I would probably prioritize doing your weight training and resistance resistance first and then cardio afterwards. It's easy to negatively impact your weight training performance through cardio, but it's not so easy to negatively impact your cardio performance through weight training. So again, just swap them around with a, maybe a brief five to seven minute cardio warm up to begin with. To clarify, that warm up should not be intensive. That should, warm up should not be massively strenuous. You should get warm. You should probably break out into a light sweat, but you shouldn't be feeling like your life is flashing before your eyes and you're contemplating every bad decision you've ever made throughout your entire life. If you're doing 10 to 12 reps for every single exercise. It means you're not lifting heavy enough. You're not probably progressing overloading. Again, kind of valid, but also kind of not in the sense that the rep range you choose to do, provided it's kind of within the five to 30 rep range, which is typically what they deem to be the hypertrophy rep range, doesn't really matter to a massive extent. It does to an extent, but I'm gonna to get to that shortly. What really matters is your intensity. So whether you're doing a set of five to failure, 12 to failure, or 30 to failure, you are likely going to yield a similar hypertrophy response. Therefore, doing 10 to 12 for every movement, provided you're trained to failure, isn't necessarily a bad thing. That being said, if you're doing 10 to 12 four sets trained to failure, you probably aren't trained to failure because you shouldn't be able to repeat the same number of reps provided you are actually trained to failure. So you shouldn't be able to do four sets of 12. That would imply you're maybe not training hard enough. You should probably go 12, 11, 10, 9. Therefore, you're out of the 10 to 12 rep range. It is also relevant for another reason. We can identify that you achieve the same hypertrophy stimulus provided you are trained to failure if you do five reps or 30 reps. Are you more likely to take a set of five to failure or a set of 30 to failure? Probably five because doing 25 kind of filler reps to get to that 30 point might be very mentally taxing. You can't be bothered. It's just too much. So many reps. I'm just mentally fatigued even thinking about doing that many reps. But also doing the extra reps within that set of 30 that aren't necessarily yielding a sufficient hypertrophy stimulus could also be very taxing because you're doing more movement. You're fatiguing your body further but still achieving the same stimulus as if you were doing five reps. Most of the reps I perform are usually within the five to 10 range for most movements. Not all of them. There are some movements I might opt to do higher reps on. I say higher, it's usually, let's say, eight to 15. There are other movements I might opt to do really high reps of like 20, 30, even more than that. But those movements usually aren't for the goal of hypertrophy. They're normally for mobility, prehab, something along those lines. Like rope face pulls, for example, I might do up to 50 plus reps on those. But when it comes to hypertrophy, most of my work is within the five to 10 rep range, sometimes pushing up to a bit higher, let's say 15, maybe a bit beyond that, but I would say at least half, if not more than, is going to be in the five to 10 range. Links down below and maybe even the comment section too, you will find a few links. One of them will be applying for one-to-one -one coaching with either myself, Ryder, or Beth, where you can work with one of us on a one-to-one -one basis to help you achieve your goals. Another link might be the guides. You've got the growth guide, you've got the home workout handbook. Pending on July 17th, you're going to have an upper body workout guide and a glute workout guide as well, which not only include many, many weeks of programming, so you have a program to follow, but also lots of information surrounding training and how to get the most 
out of your training. In addition to that, you've also got the group coaching, which is run through Train Heroic, where I write programs for the community. So you've got a home workouts program to follow, which you can follow either on your own or with the community. We can talk to me as well. You've got a gym based program, but you've also got a Train Like Me program where you can follow the exact workouts I'm doing and I'm essentially doing the same program as you, which is quite exciting. So if any of those appeal to you, have a gander at the links below in the description and also the comment section. But if they don't, ignore everything I've just said. When you pick a heavy weight, you want to pick a weight that you can, yes, it challenges you so it's heavy, but you can still manage the full range of motion. Actually, another very valid point. Just because you're adding weight and pushing it further and harder doesn't mean you should sacrifice technique. Technique should be very much standardized, which means every rep should look largely the same. Whether you're doing a warm-up set, whether you're training to failure, whether you're doing a lot of load or not a lot of load, every rep should look the same. That's what we call standardized technique. If the increase of weight results in your technique breaking down to the point where it's kind of outside of what I would deem to be adequate range of motion, then you're probably ego lifting and you're probably pushing it too far. So it's about standardizing that range of motion, finding a weight that allows you to fail within your target rep range, within that range of motion. And when you can no longer complete that full range of motion, you can either opt to do some partial reps, which I am a fan of in many cases, or you can identify, I've reached failure, this is it. Keep things consistent, go through the full range of motion, recruit the muscles you want to recruit, work the muscles you're trying to work, and try and do a little bit more every week if you can, be that an extra rep, a little bit extra weight. But if your form starts breaking down, your technique is no longer standardized and something needs to change. I already know that so many of you will be making this mistake. Um, because I've seen it at the gym, I see it at the gym all the time. If you wear any of these shoes, okay, or Converse as well, as really bad. Yeah, I think wrong shoes can definitely be a, a contributing factor. I think ultimately, in ideal world, you'd opt for a shoe with like a wide toe box and also one that's supportive, not necessarily spongy, depending on what you're doing. So if you're running, you probably want more of a spongy sole than one that's gonna give you kind of bounce and absorb impact, fantastic. But if you're weight training, I typically opt for something with a flat sole or I'll opt for something with a raised heel. So if I'm doing upper body days, I'll just opt for something with a flat sole, something that is comfy, something that doesn't have any kind of bells and whistles, nothing fancy. If I am doing a leg day or training, like especially a squat pad, if I'm doing anything that involves a multi-joint quad movement especially, I will likely wear a shoe that has a raised heel. This can encourage a bit more knee flexion, which means your knees can travel further, which means not only can you kind of make up for any ankle mobility deficits you may have, but therefore go through a greater range of motion when you're performing like a squat pattern, a leg press pattern or something like that. It also allows you to potentially lengthen the quad a bit further and muscles typically respond best to being worked in their length and position, especially the quads. They, they do seem to be hyper responders to stretch mediated hypertrophy. Therefore, it makes sense to try and lengthen them as much as possible to hopefully result in achieving or yielding the best hypertrophy stimulus. If I'm doing like a hip thrust or maybe a hip hinge pattern, like an RDL perhaps, I probably opt for a flat sole shoe because knee flexion is not gonna be relevant there. Therefore, you don't need the lifting heel. We want something that's gonna provide a stable base and provide enough balance for you to essentially go through that range of motion of the movement you're trying to perform effectively without anything kind of disrupting that. You want to get more out of your glutes, you want to actually pick up a lighter weight and distance yourself and distance the weight from yourself. You essentially want to use whatever weight allows you to train within your target rep range to, if not close to failure, without causing you any problems. Provided you can go through the range of motion you want to go through, provided you can train to, if not close to failure, and provided you can lift in a healthy and safe manner, hold the weight where you want to hold it, really. A powerlifter back in the day, uh, Pete Rubish, used to be a big fan of doing movements like this, but with a barbell and essentially just really overloading them. He'd lift up to 500 plus pounds with it. And he was a bloody strong man, a bloody big deadlifter. And I'm pretty sure he probably had some juicy glutes too. But the one point she made there was like really making sure you're arching your upper back and like bending your neck forward as well. That's not really necessary. If you look about what you're trying to work, which is essentially the glutes here, arching your upper back is not gonna change how those glutes are working. You may convince yourself it's like increasing sensation or whatnot. Biomechanically, what relevance does the upper back have to what the glutes are doing in this moment? I put yourself in a position that's healthy, safe, and comfortable for you, and then just go through the range of motion as you would, making sure you are kind of bending the knees slightly so you can shorten the hamstrings a bit, thus kind of reducing their involvement and shifting a bit more emphasis over to the glutes. So that's just a key point there, is just bend the knees a little bit so you can, like I said, take away some of the hamstrings, put more onto the glutes. In fairness, it caught me by surprise. Some of these tips are actually pretty bloody good, and the only one I really kind of had like a bit of an issue with, which I wouldn't even say was an issue, was the last one. But beyond that, they were all pretty splendid. Like, I respect it. I think ultimately it's really great to see somebody with quite a large a following of nearly 300,000 people that might be typically perceived from an external perspective as maybe like a booty builder or similar, especially based on some of the videos I have seen previously of, of this creator, promoting some tips that a lot of people could really benefit from and some tips that apply to not only just your glute workouts, but all of your resistance training workouts provided you 
you're thinking about the context of hypertrophy. I'm pleasantly surprised, genuinely. Now we're very quickly going to crack on with the comment question of the week. Can you talk a bit about deload week, like how you manage your schedule and workout? There's an argument that you don't need to deload whatsoever, and I actually don't deload very frequently whatsoever either. If you really manage your volume well, then the, the, you can justify not getting away with not deloading that frequently at all, because again, you should be managing volume to the point where you don't feel like you need to deload that often. But I know back in the day, people used to promote deloading that every month or so, when in reality it's because they were doing such excessive volume. Now if I deload, it might only be a couple of times a year or so, and that's largely just because things have been going on, maybe with stresses external to just training. I probably need a bit of a time to chill just to kind of recover, and maybe got a few niggles popping up here and there but beyond that honestly like deloading is not that complex minimize how often you deload so deload as infrequently as possible maybe never maybe two or three times a year or so who knows it really depends on what you're training for and how you're training and then if you are going to deload just essentially do less than you would normally do so if you're training to failure i would probably deload by going let's say four to six reps in reserve and i decrease volume that's pretty much it just for essentially just do less but you should also make sure it's not easy it's not by any means really easy you still have to work it's just easier than you would typically train but yeah, that is it. That is the video. Thank you for tolerating me. Thank you for tolerating the fact that Pump Fiction Podcast has just released episode 19. So if you're watching this, there is another Pump Fiction Podcast episode where we talk about mental health. We talk about training bits and balls. We talk about life. Very exciting. So have a gander at that. And thank you for tolerating the video.